context. First of all, um, I, I spend about sort of ninety percent of my time thinking about the, the title. So the title is the best part, and then it goes quickly downhill after that. It's like, so in, in, innovate to dominate. It's like um, it's like um, it's it's catchy, which is um, unusual for an academic book. And then it's like the next part, um, sort of like China, China's rise as a techno security power. That's when it loses people. Well, but, but I'll try to sort of explain. So, um, in terms of the background of the book, sort of like um, I started sort of um, sort of writing this book um, as sort of when Xi Jinping assumes power, sort of like um, ten. 10 years ago. So this is sort of like, uh, it's been sort of like um, a long time in, in the making. And this book is about the first two terms of Xi Jinping's sort of like time in, in power. I, I have a prior book, which is sort of called Fortifying China. And if you come back to me at the end, I, 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 I have a, a deal that I can sell two books to, to you for the price of one. Uh, <laughs> But it's like, uh, um, but it's like, but we have to do it at the back of a truck somewhere. <laughs> um, but the earlier book looks at so sort of like um, a lot of these issues about China's defense development, the political economy of China's security from the beginning of the People's Republic in 1949 right up until sort of um, the end of the Hu Jintao era. So if you want sort of like um, the, the 40 sort of like 50 years earlier, that's an earlier book. But the focus of this book um, is when Xi Jinping comes to a power and it's like um, when he thinks about sort of, of security, about some sort of innovation, and about the role of the state, one of the key questions I look at is that how much is there con continuity and how much is there a major change when he comes to power? And what does, does this mean in terms of China's rise as a great power? China's rise as an innovation power and China's rise as a security power. How, how, how many of you are US ta taxpayers? I presume everyone here. So the reason why, why I'm asking is that um, it's like, um, as I was doing this research, sort of like, um, I also had sort of like, um, this was supported by sort of a major grant from the US Defense Department. So, um, so I had a sort of like, um, I have a, um, sort of like a, a 10 year grant, um, which uh, was actually, it was in the, in the seven figures, it was actually more than $10 million to do the, re not, not just to do the research from, from this book, because as if it was, then I would be in prison by me, by me. <laughs> but it's like, but I had a sort of a, a, a 10 year pro project to look at China's rise as an innovation power and as a defense power. And so because of that, we did lots of conferences, we did sort of lots of books, lots of research. And over that period of time, it's like um, a key, a, a large part of it, especially at the beginning, sort of like um, in, in the first sort of like um, sort of five to six years, we did a lot of cooperation with the Chinese, with the Chinese military. I was, I spent some, some time as a, as an adjunct professor at the PLA's leading um, science and technology university over in Changsha. So a lot of this sort of work was done in sort of like, um, sort of like um, sort of in collaboration with sort of like um, with the People's Liberation Army. But as, of, as we see, both in terms of the book, but also in terms of broader US-China relationship, that relationship sort of significantly broke down. And to today, we, there's this very little um, co cooperation that that we have. But it's like, uh, but to situate this as book, there's a lot of sort of re research. In fact, there was like, um, as I was sort of like um, getting to put put, put to, to give it at the end, it was so much work, and it was like, um, and uh, and so what I try try to do is try to provide a framework to sort of like make sense of all sort of like. Um, the evidence, the descriptive pieces, sort of all these sort of like fragments that um, that sort of doesn't make sense if you don't have sort of like um, an overarching theory or all overarching frame, frame, frame framework. And 
that framework to, to me, and this is where I'll go into what the book is about, is to try to understand sort of like um, China's rise as a security, as an innovation, and as a military power by understanding the nature of the state, right? And so what I try to do at the beginning of the book is to try to provide sort of like um, sort of, um, an understanding of what I call the, the techno-security state. The, the techno-security state sort of applies to China, but I try to sort of frame it more broadly itself, that it's about, and this is the, the, the definition. And so as a car carrying member of the UCSD faculty, we have to, to define things. And one of the first things is like, what, what is the techno-security state? And this is sort of an innovation-centered, security maximizing regime that prior prioritizes the building of technological and defense capabilities to meet sort of expansive um, national security needs because of breadth of perceptions, or also because domestically of sort of like a, a powerful security um, co coalitions. That helped to understand what's going on in China today, but it's not just about China. It's uh, it's there's a lot of other rate 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 regimes and uh, and I'll go back because uh, sort of like I the techno security state is also described the U S etc or sort of Israel or other other countries and what I want to do is um, and towards the end of the book is I look at in terms of the great power competition between the U S and China today look at sort of like comparing the US techno security state with, with the Chinese techno security state and how to understand um, the nature of this com competitive competition and, and what's similar and what's different between these two states and 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 and, and, and I'll go back to that um hopefully the the, the other so the book itself um sort of like um going beyond sort of the theory of the state is to look in very I say sort of excruciating detail at the nature of the Chinese techno security state and so especially under Xi Jinping and and the book is sort of divided around sort of sort of sort of, um, sort of the chapters around these sort of sort of several key components one is um and this is the the, the beginning of the book is the rise of the national security state under Xi Jinping. So when, when Xi Jinping comes to power, he, and this is the issue about continuity, continuity and discontinuity uh, in terms of China's evolution. And I argue in, in a chapter on, on the Chinese national security state that Xi Jinping comes and he sees where China is and the threats that China faces, both externally and domestically, from a very, very different vantage point than his, his predecessors. From Deng Xiaoping to Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao, the priority for the Chinese state was about development, about economic development. And I sort of say that it's like um, that the nature of the Chinese state, sort of like um, from the beginning of the 1980s, right up until the beginning of the 2010s, was sort of similar to a developmental state where it was focused on economic development. When Xi Jinping comes to power, he he doesn't do it sort of like um, sort of very broadly initially. He's very quiet in the first few years. He sees China more from a security perspective. That security is as important, if not more important than the development. So we see the shift from sort of like an economic centric to a security centric state. And, um, and a large part of that is because he sees national security very differently. His predecessors tended to see security sort of like um, in, a, in a fairly sort of like um, real politic um, perspective, looking at sort of the, out, the outside world, look at the, the balance of power and, and how the international system can work and how sort of like um, sort of the threats that, that China faced was like in fairly traditional sort of military and geostrategic terms. Xi Jinping, um, when he comes back very quickly, he talks, of, he talks about national security and he says security, sort of the nature of national security is political security. It's about 
the security of the regime about the Communist Party and the threats that goes to sort of like um, the core stability of the state is not just about the geostrategic or not just about realpolitik. It's about sort of like um, sort of ideological. It's about sort of like sort of, um, sort of like um, the threats to the Communist Party <clears throat> dom 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 domestically. And from there, what, what we see is that Xi Jinping then begins to do a fundamental sort of like um, reordering of the nature of both the security strategy and the, the infrastructure, the organizational mechanisms that, that um, manages security. So he overhauls the national security app apparatus. He overhauls the, the military and all those apparatus when, when he comes to, to, to power. And so we see a very, very important sharp departure with um, from, from national security. And from there, the book then so then begins to then look, looks at sort of what, what is going on at, at, at the same time. So national security is different. And then when, when she, and then another chapter looks at the notion of, of, of innovation and sort of like um and under Chinese leaders, especially from Jiang Zemin to Hu Jintao, sort of in innovation is sort of like um at, at, at the core of the development process. For China, 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 but whereas, so like, um, in innovation, science and technology development is important, especially um, sort of like, um, in the first decade of the twenty first century. When Xi Jinping comes, he says, in innovation is even more important. Whereas, like, in innovation was a top priority for his pre predecessors. Xi, Xi Jinping says, in innovation is life or death for China. And so what, what he does is that um, besides pursuing restructuring the national security state, he then says like we really need to put innovation at the at the at the very, very top. And so he drafts sort of like um what what is called sort of the innovation-driven development strategy, which is sort of like um making innovations sort or of like um sort of sort of a sort of like um a overarching sort of development model for China, as opposed to more sort of like an industrial and export-led development model under his 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 pre pre -presidency. And innovation to Xi Jinping is not just about science and technology, it's about organizational, it's about strategic, it's about it, 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 it's very, very broad. And it's both on the civilian side, but also on the military and the strategic side. And innovation becomes even more important. And then um, in, in, in sort of, um, as we move towards the, the innovation and the security parts merging <laughs> together, I look at sort of like um, the issues about how sort of like um, the innovation development, innovation driven development strategy and sort of military modernization or what Xi Jinping calls the military strengthening is critical. What does this then mean in terms of the building of Chinese military power? And sort of, and the building of Chinese military power, sort of like um, during this period of sort of time, is about sort of like um, about this notion. And this is what Xi Jinping does. So when Xi Jinping comes to power, he goes and visits military facilities and he sort of asks the generals and the soldiers there. It's like, um, well, the Chinese military, the PLA, it's it's very very big. It's one of the biggest in in the country. But he, but he says it's not very strong. <clears throat> How can we shift from being big to being strong? Which is sort of it's at the core of innovation, right? It's like I mean, how you do turn from quantity to quality, and so it's a lot of this is about high technology, but it's also about strategy. It's about organization. And so what we see sort of during this period of time, especially sort of around sort of 2015 to 2016, is this major reorganization of the nature of Chinese military power and the, and, 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 and the PLA. Initially, it's, this is sort of like, um, there's plenty of time to, to do this because while there are threats, there, there's no urgent threats, but this begins to shift, especially 
in this in the latter half of the 2010s and especially today where the issue of taiwan the issue of the us of, of that great power competition we see the arc of sort of like uh, this military strengthening this technological military technological developments so would significantly um, gain more urgency gain more acceleration and then uh, another ch ch chapter if you get this far which usually most people don't then there's a focus on what is like um, where the, it's a, it, there's a particular buzzword in, in Washington DC how do we connect the civilian and the military parts of the Chinese system together what is like um what in China until sort of a few years ago was called military civil fusion is how do you develop a do use economy that is able to so sort of like um sort of help military development but also on on civilian the, the development and so this is like um like um for example um the last few weeks we we've seen examples of this right like the Chinese sort of balloons. It's like that's an example of the due use where it's like um it was developed for some civilian purposes, but it can be used for military app, app, applications. And it's like um, especially during the, the Trump administration, there was a lot of concern that like um military civil fusion was the secret source of why China's getting so powerful and so so sort of like um and so quick. And so one of one of the things that the Trump administration began to do and the Biden administration to a lesser extent was that any, any anything that has civilian purposes but could be used for military they tend to, they call that military civil fusion and this and this is like uh, and I know sort of like um, read, read and speeches from people like Mike Pong Pong Pompeo was that military civil fusion was sort of like uh, was the most sort of like deadly strategy that 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 um, the Chinese were able to do to undermine U.S. power itself. Although in my book, I actually spend of, um, sort of 50 pages to actually um, assess military civil fusion. And the assessment is that it's an aspirational strategy, but they haven't, the Chinese have not gone very, very far in actually making it work. Because um, one, one of the things about the Chinese system is that it's very compartmentalized. That often it's like the military and the civilians, they don't really sort of talk to each other and they don't really get along. They're, the Xi Jinping is trying to do, do, do that, but there's a lot of structural pro problems in, in, in that. The last part, which um, I only started writing sort of like towards, towards the conclusion <laughs> is, is economic securitization, which is sort of like um, the next development of the techno security state, but that's only began in the last couple of years. This is what's the focus when we look in over, over the next de decade. And this is the e current securitization is that, um, especially in 2018, 2019, as China begins to get worried about sanctions, about export controls from, from the US as a key part of this great power competition, there's this focus on that the Chinese authorities say, we need to strengthen sort of the economic security of the country. We have to deal with supply chains. We have to do with technological self-reliance. We need sort of like, um, and, and all those. And, and so what, what we're seeing today is that this major effort to securitize key parts of the economy and, and that fit fits into to the, um, to, to the technical security state. And sort of like, um, and when you all come back in 20 years, that will, that'll be when my next book and it comes out on on the on on the on the economic securitization of the state, and to sort of like um, and to end, it's like um, so I to do this very very deep deep dive on the Chinese techno security state, and then I have a final chapter to sort of the conclusion chapter. And then it's like um, so what does does this mean in terms of sort of like um, sort of the competition between the U.S. and 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 China? Because right now. Especially in the last few few years, we are seeing this increasing direct, expansive, so uh, sort of the, the sort of techno security um, competition, if not adversarial confrontation between the U.S. and China, and so sort of like sort of a key characteristic of the Chinese techno security state is that it's a very 
top down state run sort of like um sort of a, a, a approach a lot of what is going on is it's controlled by xi jinping i mean he he runs a number of of all sorts of commissions and com committees that are very hand hands on and so sort of like um and this and various parts of the state apparatus, whether it's sort of like uh, ministries or the military, they are sort of like they direct a lot of these sort of um, pro 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 pro, pro program. So, so this it's this top top down uh, uh, approach, which is very different compared to the U.S. techno security state. The the U.S. is a significant techno security state, but the nature of the U.S. techno security state is that it tends to be very sort of like um, bottom up itself. So. The definition we in the book is that China has a very statist tech, techno security state. The US has what we consider an, a more of an anti statist tech, techno security state, where the market, where the private sector plays a stronger role, um, both in terms of in innovation and also in terms of sort of like um, the industrial development. Of course, these are sort of more ideal types, and the reality is, is a little bit sort of like a more closer. They, there's a more closer coup, coupling, but but fundamentally, sort of like um, the anti-status versus the statist um, states. This is going to be where the competition and where the 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 competition for dominance is going to sort of um, be fought on. It's like, is this going to be sort of like um, the Chinese statist re regime in turn and how that's governed? And how that's incentivized compared to the US, how that works. And sort of and my book sort of goes into sort of like um when you think you you you, you get to the end, there, there's an extra 50 pages that I add to 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 uh, to address this particular issue. And and uh, and one final point before I, I really end um is that um and, and I, I was writing this, uh, sort of like, um, someone asked me, it's like, um, as you write books, some, someone sort of like, some really smart person who doesn't know anything about what I would do, they ask a really cut, cutting question. And they, um, one of my friends asked, so how big is the Chinese tech, 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 techno security state? It's like, and I sort of assumed that people would know, it's like, well, I've written about this, so it must be big. And it's like, oh, that, that's a really good question. And so I actually did the calculations, like how sort of um, on the back, back of an envelope, it's like, uh, and, and the Chinese techno security state is actually not that large. I mean, it seems large. And when you look at, so like when you go into the detail, like the defense industry, the science and technology, app operator that goes for strategic means, et cetera, my calculation was that it, it's no more than about sort of like seven or 8% of GDP. And that's the same for the US. I mean, it sounds like size, sizable, but if you look at, for example, the, the Soviet Union at the height of its military buildup, it's like um, the estimates were it was about 25 to 30 percent of GDP. And the reason why this math matters is it's it's the question of like um it's like um especially in, in the US, like when, when when we look at China today, is it all about national security? And I'd say it's like um, no, it's actually there's a small very, very important part that's about national, national security, about sort of defense, about high tech, et cetera. But the vast majority of what China, China is doing, more than 90 per, per percent, has got nothing to do with security. It's, it's they're doing economic development, they're, they're about prosperity. And so there must be ways that you can sort of like, um, sort of like, um, not sort of like, um, sort, of, sort of like paint everything to do with China as national security. And ways to sort of like um, leverage sort of and sort, and you can deal and you can ring fence what is of critical security. But there's so much more that is that the US and China and other countries can cooperate with that has nothing to do on the security side. The issue, the, the problem though, is that uh, is what, what we define as national security, et cetera. Before, you, a lot of it is like um, is sort of like, like national security in terms of. Sort of like um, parts of the economy that that produce the capabilities that really threaten, but increasingly national security is becoming much more blurred, and that things like TikTok and other things are becoming national security. And so, if you redefine it, you can make it much much broader. Then there's like and then sort of things become sort of a lot more difficult. So, um, 
So I'll I'll stop it there, and then I'll hopefully allow more time for Q and A. So hopefully, um, as with the, the the classes that I teach, my my goal is to present just enough to make people really confused, and so that you 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 then you have to ask questions to try to work out what I what I was actually trying to say. <laughs> I'm the moderator, but I also get to ask the first couple of questions. So I'm going to ask you three questions. And there, but there's one question in the background of each of them, mm -hmm. and that's: Is it she, or is it the national security state? Mm -hmm. But but to get there, let me let me start with something you that you started with, and then kind of came back to at the end. Um, when you said China was a techno security state, but that the U.S. and Israel were too. I found myself wondering, and, and this is in the book too, um, seems like there's a difference because China is a techno security state, whereas the US and Israel have a techno security state. Mm -hmm. But then you kind of, in a way at the end, you came back and, and said that China too has a techno security state. But well, what do you think? I mean, is the, is the political regime in China one that is fundamentally a techno security state that drives everything else? Um, I think it, it, it is today. And um, I mean, it's like a, sort of at the outset, so in the first term of what Xi Jinping sort of, um, gets in power, so from 2012 to 2017, he begins to lay the foundations, right? So it's like, so the, so the techno security state is beginning to sort of grow, but it's still in this infancy. So sort of like um, in the second term, it begins to grow. So sort of the foundations are laid, so sort of like, and now it's beginning to grow, but it's still sort of li 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 limited itself. But I would say, um, and especially, um, it's like um, we see with the party Hong Kong Congress of last October, it's like when you compare Xi Jinping's work reports, Sort of from the 18th Party Congress to the 19th Party Congress to the 20th Party Congress, the focus on security, especially in the 20th Party Congress, has been very, very clear and so very, very expansive. But before, it's much more muted, muted. So what what we see is this techno security in, in China is has really, really grown, um, and it's um, and today I think it's um, we see more and more of it, like really sort of like um, blossoming. So, so that's like from a techno security state, we're seeing increasingly that China is becoming the tech, tech, techno security state. Exactly. Is there anybody, any other country that you would say is in the same category? Um, North Korea is very, very clearly like that, and staff knows more about that. Um, I mean, I would, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's, I mean, you rightly point, point out, I mean, with the US and with Israel, I mean, there are clear sort of like um, sort of um, structures, structural stru stru limitations. I mean, it's like um, there, I mean, it's like um, the nature of the techno security state there, it's like because there's more of an anti status sort of norms there, et cetera, there's, there's all push pushbacks, there's sort of like lim limitations. The, the nature of the Chinese techno security state, it's like, uh, I mean, an another sort of chap, 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 chap in my book, like, looks at the nature of this top down, sort of like, um, state, state, dead model. Right? So it's a very authoritarian. And so it's like, um, it's what the leadership wants. And there's, there's, there's sort of very limited checks and balances on that. So, Xi Jinping is like, say, well, we need to mobilize, uh, sort of, key parts of the economy for just to serve technical security pur purposes. They can do do that. It, you can't do that as easily <laughs> in democratic or 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 liberal economic regimes. Well, that leads to my second question, um, because I mean, if we go back ten years ago, Xi Jinping comes to power. Very few people thought that China's security situation was particularly dire. Mm -hmm. I mean, quite the contrary. China was a big success story. It had much more influence, more, more power. So in the 10 years since, Xi Jinping has definitely succeeded in consolidating his own personal power. Mm -hmm. And all of these measures, you know, the securitization of everything, as somebody said, probably you, um, has certainly worked for Xi. He's, a, he's 
you know, the unquestioned dictator, but it doesn't seem like it's made China any more secure, if anything, the opposite. Mm -hmm. So is there any possibility that this is all, not all, but, but that the driver is more Xi's dictatorial tendencies mm -hmm. rather than China's regime type? Right. I mean, that, that's a great question. Um, I mean, and, and there is a fundamental paradox, right? I mean, it's like, I mean, a large part of sort of like um, she's sort of like um, building this security apparatus. I mean, it's like a lot of this is because it's the sense of insecurity, this sort of lack of conf confidence. And that sort of like um, very much, I think, sort of stands to sort of, because all, all of this is about the Communist Party about sort of like maintaining the security and the stability and the hold on power of the Communist Party, and as and um, and sort of and and one of the interesting sort of like um, sort of narr narratives sort of like when Xi Jinping comes to power is that um, it's like um, it's like um, you're you're right to point out that so like um, most sort of people at that time when they looked at China in 2012 or 2030, and you look at the Chinese Defense White Paper um, in 2013, they paint a fairly benign international um, security environment. Yes, there are tensions here and there, especially so like uh, in the East China Sea with Japan and the issues with the US, but, oh, but, but, but fundamentally, sort of the, um, the overwhelming sort of strategic analysis sort of the assessment by the mainstream sort of like um, sort of strategic community in Beijing at that time, that China was in a pretty good situation, but but Xi Jinping he goes and he says, as I can, especially when when he come 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 comes back, he talks about sort of like uh, let's look at the history lessons, and he particularly talks about the, the Soviet Union. It's like uh, and he says, it's like um, there's this issue about um, historical nihilism. That's like um, that we forgot what happened with the Soviet Union, and there's the collapse of the Soviet Union, and, and, and he talks about that so very early on. It's like, that's one, one, one of the key lessons. And that's why we have to learn that for China, we have to learn that the so, so the communist rate regimes are under rule threat. And it's not just from, from without, but it's from within. And it's a combination of both itself. And so that's why he talks about national security from a political security point of view. It's that um, it's then it's to talk about it's like um, sort of the corruption that's taking place that that's eaten in within the the the, the common system. But it's like um, it's in terms and that links into the to the external then because a lot of what's going on is tied to these external forces who are linked to the pressure and some some of these internal drivers, etc. Um, and it's like. Um, and so this is sort of like, uh, and Xi Jinping sort of brings this on. This is a very, very different from the establishment view. Yes, and and so you're right. And so that that's why it's um, over time, sort of like um, Xi Jinping very much sort of like becomes the personification of the Communist Party. The constitution gets changed. It's like, uh, and so it's like, and, like, and Xi Jinping is sort of very much like, uh, it's like. Uh, it's it's personal then that people owe their allegiance to the Communist Party, but directly to Xi Jinping, and, and, and we see this more and more. And the other question then I get asked is, what about if Xi Jinping goes? I mean, how institutionalized, how durable is this if Xi Jinping is no longer around? And and and, and uh, yes, yeah, and, and, and that's a critical question. I mean, I think it's like um, that he has no su su successes. That a lot of these institutional building is relatively new. Is that um, it's like um, there is a real concern that if he's not long, no longer there, um, that's like um, that's like um, that the structures that he builds can crum crumble because he doesn't have a, suc a succession plan, etc. But it's like um, but there are key parts of the political apparatus, especially the security co cooperation, right? the military, the intelligence apparatus, the public security apparatus, all of those have benefited greatly. And they are the ones who try to cling on and keep it if Xi Jinping is no, no, no longer around. And they've been very, very sort of like, um, sort of like um, able to grow very, very strong from, from their political power as well. 
comforting prospect. Um, I have plenty more questions, but maybe it's time to open it up to the floor and uh, I'll I'll call on people uh, and I'll try and be as fair as I can. So uh, I have one hand right there in the back. Is President Xi, or what do the Chinese people want? Do they want China to become more democratic or do they want to stay with the communist system? What do they want? So I wish we knew. Um, it's like um, there's no sort of good ways to understand. But it's like um, we don't have elections. Sort of public public opinion polls are very very sort of like um, iffy. So sort of like so the question of what of what of what the Chinese people want is very very hard to answer. Um, I mean, I would presume that it's like um, everyone sort of everyone wants pros prosperity, right? And they want to sort of like um, have that prosperity and sort of like um, and be able to sort of like um, sort of live their lives with limited sort of like um, sort of um, official in interference. Um, Xi Jinping, um, sort of like um, sort of like um, so sees it some somewhat differently. It's like um, and especially it's like um, I mean. His point is that yes, we need the prosperity is important. We need sort of equity. So sort of like we can't have the rich getting ri 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 richer, and sort of like and we have sort of this this big in 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 inequality. But then he says it's like but that can only happen if China is stable and China is secure and China is safe. And he says we we don't have that. If you look at the international environment, China is under threat. And so it's so like, um, and we, with that, we need to make sure that we secure sort of China. And so we need to sort of build that up, et cetera. And if that really requires us to sort of like, um, sort of like um, have frictions with sort of our neighbors, with the US, et cetera, that's part of sort of like, um, of, of what I have to, what I have to deal, deal, deal with. So, so the issue is like, um, for Xi Jinping, it's like uh, he tells is the people. It's like um, it, we're in a very very difficult situation now. It's not like it was sort of ten years ago. Um, and 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 he also says like what people also want is and this this goes to his notion of of his China dream. They want the great rejuvenation of the state, and they want China to assume its sort of rightful place as a major player, if not the, the dominant player on the international stage. And the only way that China can do that in Xi Jinping's eyes is that they need to sort of like um, push whoever's standing there, the, the hegemon in, in charge now, as like, um, and so like, uh, and say it's like, uh, well, it's like, um, we don't agree with the rules-based order that was set up by the US and by his allies at the end of, of, of all of the Second World War. And, they, and sort of like Xi Jinping, when he, when he talks about this, he talks about the, the, the need that the Chinese people, he told us that, that they have to struggle, they have to push back because they, no one's gonna give it to them itself. So it's, um, it's a fairly assertive approach itself. So these are all the things about sort of what Xi Jinping thinks, what the people want. And, um, and, um, it's like um, he's been voted into power three times, so it's like um, he doesn't think that it's like um, that it's like um, that he's not on sort of like on the right platform as the leader to make this happen. Well, to follow up on that, though, what would be your guess of the number of people, you know, who matter, who actually think that Xi Jinping has made China less secure by being too assertive? Do you mm -hmm. think that's a really Strong opinion group, or do you, or do you speculation uh, is not right. I mean, we don't know. But. We, we we don't know. I mean, it's like I mean, we hear like voices every now and then, but these voices are tend to be from academics. Um, so like um, from sort of like um, from from the from the intelligentsia itself, we don't hear it sort of from the from the center of power and from the center of power from 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 the elites. There's like um, no one's pushing back on this, um, but I sus 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 suspect. I mean, it's like if you look at how she he he Jinping 
has picked and chosen the people around him, the security co 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 coalition, they very much buy into that. Those who sort of have sort of lost power, the economic bureaucracies, it's like they're they're keeping their the heads down itself. But it's like, I mean, the people have have learned, I think. It's like, I mean, you don't say so sort of, no, I mean, it's like I mean when when Xi Jinping comes to a power, I mean it's like um and and this is the sort of like um the the really in it's okay it's like um when when it, when he comes to, to power it's like he's someone who does, doesn't have a very strong power base at the center sort of like um and so um his ability to really sort of, sort of cultivate and cement his, his his power base was sort of like um sort of e extraordinary. His, his predecessors couldn't do it, Jiangsmin or Hu Jintao. And the way that Xi Jinping did it was through fear and terror. He embarks on anti-corruption. He goes and arrests like um, very, very prom prominent le leaders, people who sort of like uh, were considered to be off limit, people in who were sort of Politburo Standing Committee me 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 members, et cetera. And it goes through. It's like an even so, like the, the most powerful institutions, like the military. He didn't care. He went after them, and so he was able to consolidate his power through this, or like uh, through fear and terror. And with that, where so like um, sort of thousands, if not tens of thousands, of sort of like from senior to middle ranking to junior sort of people, sort of like officials being arrested. It's like um, it's not surprising that it's like um, no one sort of like says. Well, I don't agree with you, um, Chair, Chairman Xi, and this is the reason why. That doesn't really sort of like, um, like um, it's, it's good for your career. Uh, Tom was next. I'm interested in, from a U.S. engagement perspective, um, uh, it seems to me that President Xi, based on what you're saying and I understand it, can look at a lot of things over the last <clears throat> several years and say it confirms what he was thinking about the need for techno security, um, whether it's export controls, uh, problems with that they're having with semiconductors, um, and then also look at the the well functioning Chinese entity across the the water there in Taiwan. These are all threats that I could see him perceiving as exactly what he was concerned about, and that justifies what he's been doing. Mm -hmm. So the question is, have we kind of moved him more in that direction, and mm -hmm. what should we be doing? Um, it, in, in any way to try to um, deal with this? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, that's a great question, Don. I mean, it's like, um, I mean, a lot of this was going on. It's like this building of the security state, the techno security aspect of like, um, et cetera. And it's like, um, and then it's like, um, what really acts the accelerator was like um, the, the great power competition. And so when we see, especially, so the, the, the tail end of the second Obama administration, but particularly the, the Trump administration. So like um, Xi Jinping sort of sees these con concerns, et cetera, and they're there. But then it's like, um, so when the US imposes the export control regime and the sanctions, it's like, um, and it's like, um, and it and continues that into the Biden administration. Yes, it's really, really sort of like, um, so sort of, um, sort of it helps the self-fulfilling prop 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 prophecy of, yeah. of Xi Jinping. So, and if very, sorry, and so what, what we're seeing now is that uh, if this was the curve that, that was going on, um, it's now at, at that rate. And sort of like, uh, and the pace of this techno securitization of what we're going in China is like uh, in, in its first 10 years, it's accelerating even more sharply over the, these next 10 years, et cetera. With, for, for example, it's um, in 2017 at the 19th Party Con Congress, Xi Jinping provides a timeline for China's military modernization. What he says is that by 2035, China would sort of like um, sort of com complete its defense modernization, defense modernization. By 2049, the 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic, China would begin to compete for global supremacy. At the 20th Party Hong Kong Congress, five years later, last October, he says the timeline shifted. Now, 2027. We have to build not all the military, but, but key parts of the defense modern idea because of what is going on, part because of Taiwan, but also because of all this great power competition. So we are seeing now that Xi Jinping, and it's like, uh, and at, at, at the MPC, 
we're seeing, especially on, on innovation, that they're reorganizing how they're sort of like engaging in science and technology innovation. The establishment of a new sort of party committee for science and technology sort of has the echoes of what Mao Zedong was doing sort of at the height of the Cold War in the 1950s, where we can't leave it to the state. We have to move it into the heart of our, our body. So uh, yes, so what the U.S. and the West is doing is like um, is like is is making sort of like um, these concerns of, of even even more. And it's like I mean, um, it's this is just gonna sort of like um, accelerate on, on on both sides. It's this this spiral. I wish I could be optimistic, but yeah. so we've got we've got Leigh and then in the back. I, I'm speaking on behalf of a large audience online. This is not my own question. So there are a lot of questions. Uh, let me see. One question is about um, the implications of the rise of technological state, whether this will lead China to adopt a technological approach to development, to agriculture, to modernization that will make it more autarkic, mm -hmm. uh, assuming that you know, that technologically they have to break the uh these barriers, you know, think about self and alliance. Mm -hmm. So that's that's the implication for the national development. There's also another question about um uh TikTok. Uh regardless of what is publicly stated, does all TikTok use user data find its way to the Chinese security services? We can talk about techno security state being narrowly defined the small part of the overall Chinese state. And can you also address that question about TikTok in that context? That's okay. great. Thanks, Dwayne. Great, thanks. Um, so the question of, of all talking. So, I mean, sort of like, um, so in around 2020, um, as the brunt of sort of like the US efforts to sort of like, um, to increasingly sort of like, um, like uh, sort of cut China off, so we'll, we'll in, sort of put excess controls and and, and chantries. The Chinese came came up with this notion of the the the, the dual circulation strategy. Right, it was like um, the need to build the domestic sources of sort of like of of economic growth rather than dependent on sort of like um on the outside world as well. But I think it's like um. So like um, so there was the sense so like um so of so sort of our our talking norms there, but I think it's um Xi Jinping is very sort of like um the, the notion of sort of like of China and the Xi Jinping is very different from China and the and the Mao sort of in the fifties and sixties China was very autarkic it was very much sort of cut off, and so what I see is like um what Xi Jinping wants wants to do is like um. That China shouldn't be cut off from from the world, and, and, and he emphasizes this. But China should develop sort of like um its sort of like um its own sort of economic sphere itself. So like um so increasing the dependence from other countries, from whether it's the Belt and Road or other parts, is like so that there is a a closer sort of engagement with China, so that if they are cut off from the U.S. And from the West, they they will still have a very large global economic footprint. So it's and so in that way, it's very different from sort of like um, the sovereign autarky that existed in in the Maoist era, to where China is at the center of sort of like um, of, of of a broader sort of economic sphere. Um, but it's it just sort of like um, doesn't necessarily have much engagement. Um, with sort of like um, with the West, so there's that, and then TikTok. On, TikTok. <laughs> on TikTok, it's like I mean that I have no idea on that. But it's like I mean, <laughs> it's, I mean, I would say it's like um, that. It's like um, if the Chinese wanted to gain access, that it that it could. Um, I mean, it's like um, the the Chinese love information, and it's like and they soak that. But there's so much information, so I would presume that sort of like. Um, and this is like, it's sort of experience from looking at sort of other ways. The Chinese um, security operators would be very, very targeted. Mm. They would sort of see it's like, a, well, we're not interested on all the information, but there may be sort of select areas. And so the question is, can the Chinese 
So like um, see what is happening in the whole TikTok ecosystem. And then they say it's like, well, there's particular segments of the population that we should be look, look, looking at. Because if, if it was all the information, they will be drowning in, in that. And so um, and so it's like to, to me, it's like China, the, the Chinese would try to be sort of so sort of, um, sort of much, much much more careful and pick if, if they need to be itself. But I think it's like, but they're also keeping a fairly low profile right now. So, in that. <laughs> My name's John. Uh, I was curious about how you see artificial intelligence playing a part into cybersecurity and the techno security race, because if the digital era that we live in, it's impossible to protect data. It's really impossible. That's the whole uh, thing where they can make currency off of it, mm -hmm. on private data. And so my question is, where do you see it playing a part in national security for both nations and them not being at the same level or mm -hmm. it is, um, without coming to the same exact end result? All right. So I guess it's like uh, one issue is like, what do we mean? By art, artificial intelligence, right? It's like is artificial a particular sort of technology, or is AI is like which is the way that I see it is more about describing sort of this 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 near era of, of what the Chinese call intelligization, right? It's about sort of like um, both in terms of machine learning, sort of artificial general intelligence. And and all of those of the the, the GPTs and all that, but it's also about the sort of rule away of big data and so like um, and the use of sort of in sort of like um sort of, sort of like um, sort of uh, sort of computers and intelligence and all and all that, and that's a very very sort of important priority. And, and the Chinese authorities, um, both in the security and on the civilian side and on the military side, they're investing very very heavily. In, in that, I mean, it's like um, so on the area that I know best rather than rambling on, it's like on the military side, et cetera. So, um, so the Chinese, they see sort of AI, sort of like, um, sort of like, um, or, or they see the nature of warfare has evolved sort of in three different distinct segments. <laughs> There's one is sort of industrial era warfare. A lot of what, 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 what we see in the Ukraine now, which is about sort of like um, the wars of, uh, wars of attrition, so like the very sort of like um, sort of like industrial era machinery. And so the Chinese sort of said, well, that was the nature of warfare right up until the 21st century. From the 21st century until now, this is the era of what they call informationalized warfare. This is about the information age itself. It's about network centric, it's sort of like um, it's about sort of like um, electronics, those types of warfare, and and that's sort of like where the the Chinese, especially the Chinese military, sees the, the nature of warfare today. But increasingly, we're we're seeing, and Xi Jinping talks about this at, at at the 20th Party Congress. He says we're beginning to shift from the information age to the intel the intelligization age, etc., where it's about autonomy. It's about sort of robotics, it's about machine learning, it's about AI. And the nature of warfare going forwards, maybe not in not right now, but maybe in five years, in 10 years, is the age of intelligization, et cetera. And so that's a very, very different um, um, sort of like um, sort of construct there. And um, and he's sort of like um, he's directed sort of lots of the strategists and all people to work. On that, and we're seeing that here in the here in the West. I mean, the the U.S. is also focused on on that. So, if you define AI much more broadly in terms of sort of like um sort of an, a new age of the is sort of like a, of the information sort of like um, frameworks, then I think it, it's the the Chinese are sort of like investing very very heavily in 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 that. It's still in the early stages. I think it's going to take a sort of another sort of like um five five to sort of seven years before we see that emerging. <clears throat> this is where it's about sort of like it's six G and going on on that. And so and, and we see it's like um so we see elements that right there's a new data plan, um sort of like grand strategy that that's just come out in the last week and they're beginning and they're trying to beginning to reorganize 
um, there's, there's the state apparatus, they, they establish a new national data group bureau and, and all that. So they're beginning to build that next stage. So that's a great lead into a question I had. You mentioned there's two systems at work here, right? The Chinese system of top down techno security state, US bottom up. Um, and this is kind of where the battle is going to be fought, right? Let's assume that the intelligization, if I can say it right, the intelligization of, uh, of everything is going to be the battleground. You know, which model is going to win out in your perspective? And I think of like, Hong Kong versus Singapore development, where mm -hmm. Singapore was extremely structured and top down versus Hong Kong was bottom up. And they wound up in like pretty similar places developmentally. I mean, looking looking here, what do you what do you see as you know the key key considerations for why mm -hmm. top down or bottom up would would kind of win out? I mean, that's a great question, and I, and I avoid and answer that because it's like um, it's like um, it's really it's like um, it's like um, it's a fool's error, error into the trap. But I guess it's like I mean, a key part of this is like um, and and, and so sort of it's it's how you balance the 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 top down versus the bottom up, right? And so this is the issue of what I would consider relationship between the state and the market, and so. Um, under Xi Jinping, it was sort of very much sort of top down. But then it's like um, sort of um, early, early on, sort of like, and this is sort of going to some some work that 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 Barry Norton does about the grand steerage, right? It's like I'm trying to find a balance. So it's not all about top 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 down, but it's like um, where sort of the, the bottom up, the private sector, the the, the 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 market can work together, and. Um, and sort of in 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 the first term, sort of like um, Xi Jinping seemed to be trying to do that balance itself. But then, sort of like um, in the second term, especially sort of like 2020, 2021, so like this, so like um, this crackdown on the tech plat, 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 plat platform, et cetera, showed that it's like um, this balance was like um, sort of um, shift into sort of very much top top down again. But I think. Um, the, the jury's out again because there's this sort of like um, sort of concept that sort of that Xi Jinping raised sort of last fall about sort of like this what he calls this new whole of nation approach to sort of like mobilizing and sort of and sort of leading sort of the development. But what kind of relationship sort of sort of like amongst firms amongst the state should be? And there's um, sort of like lively the, 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 the debate now of what sort of like um, the, the whole of nation construct should be. Is it just a, a, a top-down approach or should, should, should they do it as they were originally going to do it? It's like pick the, pick the best champions, like the ones who are doing the best, doesn't matter if they're state-owned or private, and then it's like, um, and, and use that as, as the motto. And it's also the same on the US side, right? I mean, the US side, it's sort of the anti status it's the bottom up. But as we've seen, the US is like, um, like, um, like looked at China and said, some of this is actually quite good. Industrial policy, it's like, um, it's like, I mean, government intervention. So, so the bottom up, the anti status model is not quite as bottom up as, as we see on there. So it's like, I mean, so there's a lot of own goes. That each side is doing, but I guess it's like I mean to, to me, um, I think the the China, sort of like um, Xi Jinping and the Chinese model, it's like um, they they have a lot more sort of like um, sort of like um, luggage that that they carry from that from the communist and ideological perspective. That it's like I mean, and it's like and you can't really trust them about sort of like um, like supporting the private sector. So from a governance point 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 of view, I think uh, the U.S. has done a lot better. The Chinese model is like um, is there's a lot of question marks on that. We're almost out of time. The last person I have on my list is Steph Hager, so we're going to give him a second for a quick question. Well, you know, this book has an oddly <laughs> admiring tone about the about the techno security state. In my view. I mean, it really does. You know, it's saying. This kind of organization can mobilize resources and it can break through, you know, 
old organizations and so forth. But then there's this other discourse on China that this is really not sustainable, mm -hmm. you know, that it's the, the, the absence of checks, the overreach, you know, Susan's book, mm -hmm. you know, that there's really a, a dysfunctionality to this concentration of power and right. attempt to sort mm -hmm. of mobilize things. And I, I still don't have a sense of where you really <laughs> sit on that, on that question. So unfortunately, it's like when you let Steph get the last question, he always puts his <laughs> finger on that sort of like on that on that <laughs> that sore spot, etc. No, it's, it's like yeah, I mean, the way that I sort of see it, it's like yeah, what Xi Jinping's doing is like I mean he's really sort of sort of got China by the scruff of his neck and and and, and, and he's pushed that. But yes, it's like um, but they do also sort of like have, have in there. It's like I mean, in terms of especially looking at sort of like um. The sustainability of the model, it's like how especially with, with, with the C. And I sort of and I use sort of like um and I quote sort of the the most experienced, the sharpest analyst to look at China, especially in terms of leadership. And there's this guy called Deng Xiaoping, who wrote about the overconcentration of power. It's like uh, of leaders who sort of serve for life. And what that leads to, right? And he did sort of like he did really a sharp essay on that. It's like and this leads to no good, etc. Right. And it's like uh, and so to to admit, it's like uh, and so on that. It's like I mean, what Xi Jinping has has done is that um, he's built all this up. But I think the long term, it won't survive if he doesn't sort of like. Um, find ways to institutionalize it to sort of like um to make it sort of like uh sort of less about him and more about like about the state and the party state etc and so i think it's like it's he's built these foundations and um and and a lot of these foundations are <clears throat> the fundamental flaws that it's like um that I see it's like I mean, this is what led to the class of the old the Soviet Union and such um, um and a lot of this like I mean Techno security state by themselves is like um they tend to sort of get more paranoid, they will get more threat of, 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 of obsessed, and that eventually leads and powers on. And so um um it's like um if I had to yeah, I think that that, that the ultimate fate for China is not good. But how could this China could sort of this China seed me could be in, in charge for another 10, 15, 15 years. So it, it might not sort of happen anytime soon. And it's like, a, and that 10 to 15 years just builds on to that. Incredible answer, incredible way to end this uh, discussion. I hate to wrap it up, but we always try and stop after an hour. We're already a few minutes late. For those of you online, you maybe can't tell, but the atmosphere in the room here is a completely wrapped attention to everything that Tommy Chung is saying. I have to terminate it. That's my job, but I also have to remind people that a week from today, the Ellsworth lecture is going to be really interesting. Susan Thornton, one of the most interesting voices, advocating a more moderate policy and more outreach to China is going to give that lecture. Should be fascinating. Everybody here in the line, thank you very much.